Hello, 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 and welcome to Things Fall Apart, Looking Back to See Ahead. I'm Claudia Alec, and what we are attempting to do here is an interactive community roundtable using several different platforms. I acknowledged when we were in our um, prep session that if we were doing this in a physically shared space, I would casually during lunch be chatting with people, very slowly letting folks know how it was going to work. We'd have a circle of chairs in the middle and then another circle of chairs surrounding, and it would be a little bit like a fishbowl exercise. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to frame what we're doing, then I'm going to model what we're doing, and then I'm going to invite our amazing roundtable and y'all to introduce yourselves and join the conversation. As the experimental wing of the American theater, how do we reckon with the field-wide challenges we have been unable to meet? What have we been unwilling to acknowledge? What's the civic contract between artists and community? How do we pass the torch to new leaders that our field needs? In the midst of pandemic and economic crisis, what are the new structures that we have to imagine? And when is closing something actually a liberatory practice? What and how do we dismantle as we build forward? Hopefully this is going to be a conversation that has people in it that have experiences of having closed things, that have people who have experience with trying a new thing and not being sure if it's going to work. And people who have experiences of being in the middle of trying a new thing. The point of this field-wide conversation is to give us a moment to reflect with each other. This is one of the hardest conversations to have. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody ever wants to talk about why the company closed, when it closed. People want to move forward and move on. Why? Because I think some of us tell ourselves this story that closing is failure and failure must be denied and avoided rather than failure actually being part of the developmental process. And once we acknowledge what's not working, we can then build forward better. Um, I'm going to introduce myself and I'm going to share um, a story of a time when I closed something and then something I learned. Then I'm going to invite my colleagues in the panel. They're going to be invited to either respond to that learning, or they can share a story themselves. I'm going to invite you to introduce yourself as well before you speak. Um, our audience doesn't know you. I know that you're all amazing. You are all amazing people with these deep practices. So I'm just going to just ask you to please blow up your spot. Please brag on yourself just a little bit so that the audience can really understand why, um, why the knowledge we're receiving from you is so wonderful. And also it just helps us to know who our community is just a little bit more. And audience, we're inviting you to join us. This is fishbowl style. Now, normally you would just tap me on the shoulder and I would go into the outer circle and you come into the inner circle. What we're doing is we're going to put a link in that crowdcast chat. You'll click on that link, come into the Zoom. Don't worry, you won't come straight into this room. We have another room that you'll go into. You can talk to someone and say, okay, I'm ready. And then you can join us for this conversation. Also, we have permission to leave this space. If there's like 500 of us, I don't know what's going to happen. I also just want to encourage you to be uh, using your chat to talk. Thank you for, my, for your patience with my preamble. Let us begin. <sighs> things, fall up, things fall apart, looking back to see ahead. I am Claudia Alec. My gender pronouns are they, their, she, hers. I'm speaking to you from the Calling Up Justice Studios based in the uh, land of the Ohlone people. The people are still alive. Um, my practice is a transmedia social justice practice. So we're consulting with arts professionals and grantors. We're um, developing theater and producing theater digitally and in physically shared space. And we're also just trying to make a lot of resources and doing a lot of performances in social media that are about disrupting white supremacy culture. This is my story. So in 2008, I was the artistic director of a theater company. It was a hip hop theater company in New York called Smoking Word Productions. Smoking Word Productions was, I, I, got to, I think our, our entire budget was like maybe 
$10,000 a year. Like we were super low budget, but we were producing prolifically doing things just very guerrilla style. Um, and I was offered a position on the West Coast at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I went to the company and I asked them, should we continue? And because I'd gotten permission from the new job saying, yes, if you want to maintain your other practice, you can. And maybe we'll, we'll have to figure out like time off for you to go back to New York. So I asked my company, do you want to continue? Because part of our practice was meeting weekly in shared space over food. There was a real physically shared space aspect to our practice. Also, this was in 2007, and it was just a little bit before everybody easily had access to technology to allow them to collaborate remotely. So we made the choice to shut it down. And it was a scary choice, but it also felt so freeing. And ultimately, we felt like the idea of having to have a like of success, meaning your company lasts forever and ever and only gets bigger and bigger and bigger that actually felt like a really scary horrible idea to us we were like that that feels like colonialism that feels like that that, that feels kind of monstrous like we don't want to do that what if what if success is we did this dope thing for seven years and now we're doing something else and i can name that it is success because dialect was one uh, was an associate artistic director of the company and here I am in shared space with this entire festival and dialect um, and myself, we're still collaborating on a field-wide level. So it felt like success at the time and it still feels like success today. And that's the end of my story. And now I'm gonna open it up to anyone to say, hey, I have something. And then you get to speak, please introduce yourself before you speak. Can I, I can speak next. I can introduce myself and then I have a question for you, Claudia. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Allison Dela Cruz. I also go by Dela. Uh, I am currently also um, uh, on Ohlone land and um, am visiting family. So I'm realizing how bright this room is that I'm in, but I'm grateful to be here. Um, and I am a theater maker, multi multidisciplinary um, artist, and also part of a brand new ensemble called Outside in Theater. Uh, in Los Angeles, and we are currently building. We don't even, our full space is not even built out yet, but I also am a part of, um, have been a part of different ensembles over the years, and um, I'm also on the net board, and have had some uh, experience producing um, in diverse communities. Um, and Claudia, I really appreciated your story, and I think my question is, when you all made the decision, was there any was there a dialogue between folks about the, the the decision to cut? Like, how did that process work? And I guess my other question is, um, was there conflict about it? I mean, it sounds like it felt like a good decision for everybody, but I was just curious how that decision-making process practice worked in the company as yeah. you all exited. Um, um, it was complicated. Um, I, I, I'm trying to remember if it was a series of conversations or if we had like one deep dive conversation where we were like, this is what we collectively decided? <gasps> okay, okay. And I, I recall at the time being like, I am afraid that I am throwing away all of our social capital because we had a company that had um, the social capital of Dominique Morisot. But like I knew, I knew at the time that our company was all of the national leaders that just hadn't gotten a chance to like, that hadn't been plucked by the other regional theaters yet. So I knew that dissolving meant that we were dissolving a story and a piece of what we were doing in the world. So I was, I think I was, some of us were scared also that we were lying to ourselves, that our social connections were strong enough to exist outside of the formality of that company structure. So I, again, I'll just name, I'm grateful that it, that it turned out right and that, that it, it felt like we made the right choice and that it still today feels like we're still in practice with each other, even though it's not through the formal mechanism of smoke and word productions. And from the audience, um, success is not necessarily perpetuity. Thank you from our audience. 
Um, I can build on that, I guess. Um, hi, I'm Anna Schneiderman. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm also on Ohlone land in Oakland, California. And um, I, I was the co-founder and executive director of Ragged Wing Ensemble um, for 17 years. And so I, I co-founded the company with um, our artistic director, Amy Sass, and another collaborator, Keith Davis, and a handful of other people in um, 2004. And it was, so I'm, I'm going to share a story. And it, it's, <laughs> I guess, just realized I'm just going to share a story. And um, it does connect very much to this idea of challenging the myth of corporate perpetuity, which was like a phrase that came up a lot in our process. Um, so I'm just going to kind of build on that um, by telling our story. Um, so yeah, so we we created the company in, in 2004. For the first, you know, many years, it was like a kind of passion project sort of on the side while the, while we all had full-time teaching jobs. Um, we were all teaching theater in schools. Um, but, you know, we had this company and we created ensemble theater and we started creating original work. We created our own process for creating original multidisciplinary work um, over many years. Um, we had a core company, it, you know, the, the company kind of like got its own momentum going over several years. We, you know, we developed an audience. Um, we developed our own kind of aesthetic and style and process. Um, and then um, around 2012, we, we, had, we didn't have a space. We were um, uh, spaceless and nomadic around the East Bay and um, did a lot of shows in outdoor locations and non-traditional spaces. And then um, we had a point where we were like, if we're gonna really do this, we need to have a venue. And there was no um, black box theater in Oakland. So we created a venue called The Flight Deck, um, which we ran for six years um, from 2014 until 2020. Um, and it was shared, so we had 70 arts groups using the space every year, and um, and uh, it was like a vibrant and amazing space with a lot going on, and Ragged Wing continued to grow and create these kind of bigger and bigger shows and, um, you know, bigger and bigger audiences and um, and also connect with a lot of, of Oakland-based arts groups, not just theater, but also dance and music and um, visual art and film and you know all kinds of different multidisciplinary groups. It was very it was very beautiful. Um, and um, we got to the point where I, so uh, we just realized that it it looked like this total su success from the outside and we got all these accolades and all of these you know funders were like you guys are you know doing it the way you're supposed to do it and yet it it was all kind of like hanging by a thread the whole time, you know and um, Everybody was getting paid, but nobody was really getting paid quite enough, and um, there wasn't enough stability and and the kind of like um, the overwork underpaid um, endemic problem was very real in our world and um, and then there were also just kind of like structural issues that we were trying to resolve and figure out like okay you know what's the relationship between ragged wing and the flight deck what's the kind of power structures and how do we read you know re it kind of emerged it we didn't we didn't like really kind of strategize and plan the structure of it it just kind of like came about and then um we sort of realized certain things that really needed to shift um in order for us to really continue both in terms of folks being able to live and make enough money and also in terms of just power sharing so we started really working on all of that um Oh, and, and it's, you know, so it was, it was co-founded, my, myself and my co-founder are both white women. And so that was also something that we were very aware of. And we were like, okay, you know, this, the, you know, the power dynamics need to shift, you know, if this is really going to continue. So, um, you know, we realized at a certain point that Ragged Wing couldn't really continue to run the venue, that there was not, that that was, that that was sort of not working out and that there had to be like a more of a separation between the theater company and the venue. It had, the venue had kind of created its own identity. So we figured out we needed to leave the space. There was this whole long process of figuring out what was going to happen to the space. Eventually we did pass it off to another organization. And then we were in this process of like, okay, Ragged Wing is going to have this whole new life, you know, post venue. What is that going to look like? And also I was, um, started to realize that I wanted to work kind of more in a systemic way, like not inside one organization, but more like through this whole process, I had sort of understood the systemic problems that we were facing, not just our organization, but the whole field. And I wanted to work on that more. So I was kind of getting interested in, in working in a more systemic way. So I was wanting to step out of the ED role, um, but continue to stay involved, involved in some way if it was supportive. And then we had this whole uh, process whereby we, you know, I was trying to step out and then we brought somebody else in and it was beautiful. And we were on the way towards creating this 
really lovely shared leadership model with, with three people, um, none of them being me. And I was kind of like, we were designing this and I was about to step out and we'd created this whole new vision for Ragged Wing. And then one of those people got an amazing job elsewhere that couldn't really be turned down. And it, I'd, I mean, not that that was the only thing, but that was sort of the turning point where we were like, I don't think we can go through this all over again. And we had a very, very deep process um, with our, uh, with the leadership team, with our board. And then we, you know, we brought in our artists and, you know, the community and we're just like, what really, what, what is really possible here? And, um, you know, as a lot of companies do, it was, and, you know, I, I wonder if this was a, a factor in your story as well, Claudia, like, there was a lot of, um, like, it, it was sort of founder dependent in the end, like, and we were trying to shift that. We were really trying to shift that into this, this broader, um, you know, power sharing model, but like, it, it was, it was, it was delicate, right? <laughs> and, and too many, you take sort of too many pieces out and, and um, there was, a, there wasn't the energy for, for institution building um, beyond where we were. Everybody wanted to create artistic work, but the kind of institution building was really hard to maintain. Um, so we had a long process about it. We, we, we had all these different scenarios that were potentially going to happen. We, we talked about them. We went through all this whole process. And in the end, we were like, you know what? It's time to let it go. And um, once we made that decision, it felt very, very right. And then we went through a whole process about it, of you know, telling the different people in our community. We had a, a public community ritual, which really felt like... Um, a funeral really, but like a really joyful one. And, you know, I kept saying, people kept asking me like, how are you feeling? Are you sad? And, um, and I was like, yes, I'm sad. There's a lot of, there's a lot of grief here, but it really felt like um, the way it feels when a, a loved elder dies, where it's really sad and there's a lot of grief and loss, um, but it also feels natural. Um, and that's my child. So I'm going to stop talking right now. <laughs> Um, I will pause there. Oh, that is amazing. Well, I, I want to invite Cherie or Jeanette into the conversation. I know that you have some different viewpoints and vantage points. Um, I, I just, I love the idea of the, of a wake, a performative wake for your institution. Um, 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 uh, founder Jenga, what piece can you take out without toppling it? This is an, um, um, a comment from our audience. Thank you to Emily. Um, uh, we, we've actually had some really poetic and amazing comments from the audience. Sometimes a story needs to dissolve before a new story arises. Um, um, hanging on by a thread the whole time, that can be so real and it can be incredibly complicated to admit it in order to improve. Again, I think one of the biggest problems of our field is that we're um, enmeshed in supremacy culture that forces us to be in denial of things that aren't working. So it's 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 exciting to have an exchange about how to end something, but it's also I think good to hear that the precarity of some of our structures. That's useful. Well, I'm happy to go next. <laughs> if that's okay, Jeanette. Um, hi everyone. My name is Cherie Hill. I go by she, her pronouns. And uh, currently, well, I'm a dancer, choreographer, mother, uh, praiser, and I currently am director of art and community at Hope More Dance the Bridge Project, which is an organization that is based on Ramatouche Alonely land in San Francisco, California. I am currently zooming in from Payo Kuwicham homeland, which is in Southern California, and happy to be here. And I joined HMD, um, we're now going by HMD The Bridge Project, because that's been part of our, I'll say, evolution or transformation in the last couple years is to slightly alter the name right now. Um, but I joined in 2019 as a community engagement coordinator. Part of our work is it, the the organization was founded by Hope Moore, who uh, is a white choreographer, dancer, founder, and uh, part of it is the Bridge Project, which is a program to bring equity and cultural driven conversations through workshops and residency programs for artists who have been underrepresented due to our um, capitalist and 
colonial and white supremacist systems that we live in. And I will say that I've, I'm hearing maybe some similarities to our stories. Um, I'm not founder, so I'm not speaking today from a founder perspective, but someone who was brought in and then invited to become um, a shared leader within the organization. So uh, in January, 2020, Hope Moore, our founder, uh, who was artistic director, invited me and my colleague, Carla Quintero, who were both employees of the organization um, part-time, we all worked part-time, to become co-leaders with her. I think she had a vision of wanting to distribute leadership more and share leadership more. So we were invited to become co-directors of the Bridge Project specifically. and both myself and Carla said yes to that invitation and hence started the distributive leadership model that we've been in process with and that's been emerging over the last couple of years. And it's been pretty layered. Um, I obviously am not gonna be able to tell every detail, <laughs> but I will try to share somewhat of a story that um, we came on and we, gratefully started working with a consult consultation group called Leader Spring. And we worked with Safi Jero there for about a year and a half, which was really, really great for us. Um, because I think what started as a small vision of taking staff and wanting to share leadership turned into a more macrocosm vision of not only staff sharing leadership, but board also rising up to share leadership as well as artists in the community being brought in to be part of the voice and the vision of where the organization could go and what was desired um, for the path it was headed. So we've had a lot of input from artists in the community that we serve and our model uh, has shifted to have the, us as three co-directors as well as an artist council that we are just starting this month, who will take over um, a good chunk of our funds for curation. And um, we're also working with a board who there's been some shifts, some people stepped off um, and then we've had new people come on. They're all artists, they're all volunteering their time. Uh, they're primarily artists of color as well to also have a voice in where the organization is going. and. Some big things I think that happened was um, Hope as a founder, as a white woman has been really great and brave and stepping back um, more and letting other people come in to have voice and lead, as well as we've talked about too in our like community leadership conversations of like, what does that mean? Because, you know, you don't just get to step back and like give all the hard work over to artist of color <laughs> to like make it happen, right? That you're still needed within that circle. And so we've all been working on what our roles are, massaging the nuances of how do we contribute? Where do we need to step up? Where do we need to step back and things like that. Um, we're also recently, the decision's been made to change the name. Um, we all came to a consensus that continuing to hold a white founder's name within the organization does not match the values of equity and anti-racism and diversity and you know all those great things that we're trying to do. So um, we are beginning a process of a name change and yeah, and it's continuing to emerge and evolve. And you know, Anna, I heard your story and it, yeah, <laughs> I think about we've done all this work and wow, what a decision to then, you know, get to a place and say we have to close. Um, uh, that, is, that isn't what we're going for. I hope that we will be able to see this through. And um, we've talked about timelines um, for each of us as directors and hope as founder. And I think for me, my vision is really to be able to hand it over you know, within five years to a whole new group core of people um, with, you know, sustainability in place, hopefully funding sustainability in place, structures in place, and knowing that it might not last that long, or they might take it all the way somewhere else, or they might decide to break it up and blow it up and do something, you know, like, I don't know, 
but um, so far it feels good to be part of this process to, to see something go from a, a sole founder into emerging and shared leadership and then into the next thing of like who you know is the next generation going to do something with it and, and what are they going to do with it so that's our story right now so thank you Okay, I guess that leaves me. So go, I'm Jeanette Harrison. I am, um, my family's Onondaga and I had the good fortune to grow up on my ancestral homelands on and near them. Um, and I am the artistic director and one of the five co-founders of Alter Theater, which is located on the lands of the coast Miwok. Um, and I really share, I, I, I really appreciate everybody's stories here today. Um, and the thing that I think I really want to bring forward is the this idea of um, if you are truly successful as a nonprofit, you put yourself out of visit, business because you achieve your mission. And so I actually feel like a failure because uh, I Alter Theater is like the little sister of um, Ragged Wing. I think Ragged Wing is like six months or eight months or 10 months older than us. We were also founded at the very end of 2004. Um, and, uh, you know, I keep begging us to, to close. Like, please, at, at this point in time, other theaters should be doing our work. Um, the alter theater shouldn't be needed. Um, you know, we have a mission of essentially uh, supporting artistic risk and lifting up underrepresented artists. Um, we we do uh, we've kind of we we have a playwright residency program that has sent writers who can't get considered at larger theaters. We send them on to the biggest theaters in the country. Alarissa Fast Horse is the, the name that I'll mention just because hopefully everybody knows who she is, but she had two commissions with us. And then she went on from teeny tiny altar theater with a budget of you know anywhere from $36,000 to like, I think our highest was like $98,000 a year. So boy, do I identify with that under-resourced and always barely scrapping by. But she went from us to become um, the, uh, the first Native American playwright ever in the history of this country to be produced off-Broadway. And she's still the only one who's made that leap. I watched season announcement after season announcement, theater after theater across the country and here locally, and where are the native playwrights? So, you know, if I was doing my job well, if Alter Theater was, was fulfilling our mission, we wouldn't be needed because everybody else would be doing this work and supporting these stories and supporting these artists and doing it in a culturally competent way. And it frustrates me to no end that we are all still here at Alter Theater with our teeny tiny resources having to do this heavy lifting for the entire industry. I still to this day get so many phone calls and emails saying, hey, can you help us? It's like, dude, you have a budget of how many millions of dollars and you're asking me for a free conversation? I don't know how I'm gonna feed my niece dinner tonight, come on. So, you know, I really appreciate everybody, um, everybody's thoughtfulness around this, but my grief comes from the fact that I still feel like I have to do this work. And we're not taking care of our arts administrators. We're not taking care of our artists by asking them to work at below living wage jobs and pays. Um, and everybody who works in the arts works ridiculous hours, re regardless of whether you're at the top tier or the, the, the small budget theaters, everybody is underpaid and overworked. And we need a really fundamental shift in our field in our structures and in funding equity. And I think that Alter Theater's role really in the larger theater ecosystem is to identify those pieces of the puzzle that aren't being addressed and lift them forward. You know, um, 
back when uh, we started our commissioning program, we steadily increased our commissioning fee and we published it. And a theater company two and a half times our size doubled their commissioning fee just to match us. You know, if we can do it, there's no excuse. There's no reason. We need to put people first. Um, so, you know, I've been like scribbling down little notes of phrases from people that have been so inspiring and I kind of really want to lift those all up, but it would just take, I feel like I've talked too much already. Um, so I just want to say how inspired um, and awestruck I am by all of you and all of the work that you're doing. And I will stop there. Thank you. No way. Jeanette, come on. Amazing. Um, Emily sends you hearts, Jeanette. Um, I have so many things from the chat that I want to lift up. I just want to welcome Suzanne to the conversation. And uh, I can't wait to hear from you. I also, Dela has some stories to share. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make an argument right now. I'm about to say something I didn't plan to say. So we'll see if I, if I believe it when I'm done saying it. Um, I don't think it's a failure that alter theater exists. I think it's a failure of the United States that alter theater exists without the resources of CTG, without the resources of the public theater. I think that's the failure, right? Because you have, you told a story about how you were ultimately completely necessary within the ecosystem of all cultural production, Broadway wouldn't be able to be producing a play by a Larissa Fast Horse if your company had not existed and been doing that developmental work under-resourced at your own loss, subsidizing the entire field. You're not getting those Broadway bucks, come on. So I just want to affirm your company's existence. Um, I'm, I'm selfishly very happy you exist, right? <laughs> Uh, um, let me make some space for more conversation and then oh wait actually let me let me see what I can lift up from this audience there's so many y'all have been just saying amazing things so from from Emily um, and this was I think in reference to something um, Cherie that you said that was so good distribute and share leadership more period planned obsolescence and succession in intentionality and she said it was so boss. It is so boss. Um, and yes, um, passing on a well-resourced organization. Can you do that? Because there's actually a difference between inheriting something that's well-resourced, inheriting something that has a lot of fundraising that's necessary to make it happen. And I'll name that there's a lot of leaders of color out there in the field right now. And that's the opportunity they got, right? Um, ooh, all right. Our audience is on fire, but I'm, I'm going to hush and make space for folks here in the space to talk. Y'all go ahead. But we have we have another hour. We have time for you to say more things. So Jeanette, if you had another thing you wanted to say, you can say it. Dela, Suzanne, jump in whenever you want. Just one small thing. I so appreciate that validation, Claudia. I just, I wish we were in a fishbowl so I could just go over and give you a ginormous hug. But I do want to just also acknowledge that Alter Theater isn't the only one. We exist in a community of small BITOX that are supporting these artists and doing this work. And it is all of us together that, that work and make these, these stories happen. Wow. Um, hi, I'm Suzanne. She, her, I actually am from Crowdcast um, and am also helping with the chat and also in an art share artist. Um, but I, I'm not, I was not planning to speak or be on camera today. Um, I just, I'm so inspired by this conversation um, and I had so many things to say and now I have other things to say. Um, first, I think from me as Suzanne, I think it's really important to acknowledge the strike that might be happening with IOTSE. Um, and I think, Jeanette, that is a really, I mean, it's, it, it goes for everyone. It's the, and like Claudia said, it's the United States, I think, that um, needs um, to support artists um, because we run on artists. Literally, like, what did we do during pandemic? We watched TV. We watched recordings of theater. Um, and then um, real quick, because um, I'm, learn, I'm, for me, I am really trying to actively learn how to take up space fully as myself and also learn how to step back as a white woman, um, but also find that boundary of I take up less space because of how I identify as a woman. And so I'm trying to find that balance. But I wanted to say that um, I had a question about how for early career artists who are get it, being given these beautiful mantles, um, like Cherie said, um, what are next steps for us to help build um, 
you know, build forward um, to create better um, theater companies? Um, and how do we how do we latch on to all of this great work that's happening? Um, is it just the art of asking, of putting ourselves out there? Is it you know finding those small and large theater companies? Um, I'm just curious from to hear from the panel and to hear from anyone else who wants to join the Zoom. Um, you know, what are some next steps um, so that we can stop doing the same thing over and over again? Uh, I can I can go next and share, and I think maybe a little bit about the journey. I just, first of all, really appreciate everybody sharing first, and I would ditto big time what Claudia said. Jeanette, I don't think you are the failure. I think you're actually showing us this the failure of the system, and um, and that I heard you say you were also part of a, a cohort and a cadre of companies who are trying to put forth more artists. And I think that, yeah, I think that I just want to val. I just also want to support and echo and validate and be like, you're not the failure. The fact that you're you're sitting here with us on this call to me is a humbling moment of your of your deep success, and that that the that you didn't. And I feel like we're we're. we're I have I've noticed in my career that I am often asked to make choices between my own um, wellness and what I believe to be the wellness of the artists or the communities that I want to work with. And I think about how this um, industry is set up in such a way where even when we try to advance into executive management positions as artists, as arts administrators, we don't have the same kind of support for that and what that looks like or even validation that the skills that we bring as executive managers are valid, important, and actually helping to expand notions of leadership and help us to address change. And so just super, Cherie, just super also just inspired about, yeah, what does it mean to share leadership? And so, you know, I talked a little bit about, um, I mentioned that I'm part of a new ensemble called Outside in Theater. We have two founders. Um, uh, a married couple, um, a, a white man and a, a Asian American woman. And um, there are several of us in a shared leadership model, um, four co-artistic directors. And we are also in a process. <laughs> and what I'll say is we're having deep, honest conversations about what does it mean that these founders brought together a group of artists that they love and were friends with and wanted to try to create something. And in the process of talking about what we wanted to create together, uh, a mission statement emerged and um, a connection to this moment, this particular moment in theater history and saying how, and, and the question I keep asking my company and myself is how are we different? So Suzanne, to your question, it's like, how are we different in this moment? Why is it important for a new company to emerge and discovering, you know, privacy being what it is in this cultural space? There are 10 of us and we're still a PWI. And so how do I ask these questions as somebody who's been deeply embedded in communities of color making? And I've built diverse rooms for the last 15, 20 years. I am in those rooms all the time. And so how do I collaborate? And so one of the conversations that we're deeply in as a, as a company is, what is the space for white allies right now? And what I notice is, and actually my colleagues were trying to put together a panel of like, I feel like we always have these equity, diversity, inclusion panels where it's about people of color and women, talk, queer folks talking about how we're always left out. But I don't necessarily hear um, white allies talking about here's what I'm doing, here's how I'm making space, here's how I'm unpacking my whiteness. Um, Suzanne, just to hear you say, I'm trying to take up more space as a woman, but I'm also acknowledging I'm a white woman. So what does that mean to take up the space I need and also to make the space or give space? And so I think right now in the middle of this making, um, understanding that when new groups form, you know, you get the forming, storming, norming patterns of things. But really, my question is, how, how can we acknowledge this moment in history and say, we do want to be different? So when I find myself in challenging conversations, I will just ask, how is this different? How is this moment? How are we going to address that when we make artistic decisions, the majority of people who have votes are white people in this historical moment? What does that mean for us? And so to hear the story about how a white founder has shifted her place. Um, and I just think about the last thing I want to say in this in this middle set of questions that I'm in is also how do we also create a space where white ally white creative allies can process what it is like what all the unpacking that has to happen 
in a way that doesn't recenter whiteness so that it becomes about white allies still. And so I think in this moment of, if we're really trying to create a different process, what does it mean about how we make decisions? What does it mean about, yes, we wanna create this space and I also wanna acknowledge um, the things that we've seen from the field, like affinity spaces. So cool, I want white creative allies to have an affinity space because I, I need you all to do some work. I also need affinity spaces to also unpack um, the complexity of relationship between, for somebody who is um, Philippine X, what is, and who is Latina passing at times, um, people lay a lot of different racial ambiguity onto me. And so how do I hold space for the fact that I'm given things because people think I'm part of groups? So what is my responsibility to not just talk with my white allies, but also to say, what is my process in, um, addressing anti-Blackness in Asian American and Pacific Islander communities? What is my process and practice in work that I'm doing to identify? Yes, I have people who are mixed Indigenous identified, but I also really need, but I've also heard from those folks that they're like, but Indigenous is not my full, that, that's something, a space they don't want to take up. So what does it mean for me to say, yes, I'm an ally to you, Jeanette, and I still need to do the work I need to do, because it's not just about big companies, right? It's also about what is it peer-to-peer, community-to-community. So, um, and then just thinking about, because I am in California, and because of all the things, it's like, what, how are, how are we implicated in relationship with Latinx communities and diverse communities who are surviving um, what's happening right now at our borders? So, you know, um, let the next folks that we're seeing on the range of things. So I, I guess I just want to hold hold space for the multiplicity that we're also all juggling. And that sometimes the way the politic gets played out in, in, in our industry, in our communities, it's like, there's the oppression Olympics ranking. And I just, that's not a helpful thing anymore. But part of me is like, but as an ally, what is my relationship to the ongoing work as somebody who's been in anti-bias, anti-oppression dialogues for 30 plus years, starting as a teenager, I have to remind myself, I'm never done, I'm not fixed. And so I want to remind people who are either early in their racial identity process or for, for those of us who have been in it for a while, like it's, it's marathon kind of work and it's long. <laughs> And so part of me just, my, one of my techniques is, and this is how I'll end, is just to say, I really try to celebrate the really little things that nobody else sees me have to do, especially as a leader. Like, yay, I filed our workers' comp payment. I got the accountant to pay that bill. Yes, good job, good job, you know? And so, um, so yeah, so I'll just end there by saying I'm, I'm, in the middle of the making of the things, it is easy to get very frustrated. And I'm really trying to hold on to what is the celebration I can have today? Because I need to be ready to help myself meet tomorrow. Um, and I'll end there. Oh my goodness, y'all are dropping so many jewels. I'm gonna have to rewatch this video because I'm trying to take notes, I'm trying to keep up. And there's just so many useful observations coming out of this conversation Um, because it's so complex because I'm gonna name that y'all are doing something that's really complicated. Um, You are not designing your company practice to survive and thrive within white supremacy culture. That's something you can do. You're designing to transform the culture. That's running a marathon while you're changing your shoe. That's complicated. And it does mean that sometimes you trip and fall. You skin a knee when you're doing that process. But like, it feels like there's, I like to resist cultures of urgency, but I will admit the ongoing genocide makes me feel like this is an urgent matter and that you're all engaged in deeply urgent work. Um, and you, you said, um, Dela, how can we do things different? How is this different? I love that because that allows me to um, accept all of the proof. We know people are like, theater is dead. It's like, no, theater isn't dead. Theater was never dead. The idea that rich people can make um, a system where only rich people can make theater and that can be a sustainable thing for entire communities. Well, that was never a good idea. You were keeping it alive with a lot of subsidies and grants and, and philanthropy. So we got to do something different. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to um, uh, tell a quick story. And that is Penumbra Theater. Penumbra Theater, African-American theater um, based in Minneapolis, um, um, a theater that is just, I don't feel like I would have all my August Wilson plays if Penumbra hadn't been doing what it was doing, right? So Penumbra is going out of business. I'm at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival at the time, and I'm just making the case to somebody to be like, no, you don't understand. Like they're a theater to us. If they go, Six years from now, this institution is in trouble. And so I convinced them to let me throw a fundraiser for Penumbra. So we produced a staged reading of an August Wilson play and raised, I want to say like $7,000, $8,000. And it all went to Penumbra Theater because that's what my argument was as a predominantly white institution, we would not have the play that we were currently making income and profit from if that company didn't exist. And it was actually... It served our bottom line to, to make sure our field had that institution. So that, that story was inspired by yours. I'm gonna stop talking, let anybody else join the conversation. Can I jump in? Um, I wanted to build a, a little bit, another response to Suzanne's question and build on some of the things that, that you said, Bela, which is like this question of like, what, you know, where to put yourself like the, um, in the ecosystem. Like I feel like part of Suzanne's question is like, you know, people starting or emerging or, you know, should we start a company or like, what's the best way to do this, you know? Um, and I, I just feel like in my experience, there just wasn't there. I mean, there probably still isn't, but there's, you know, whatever, 18, 20 years ago, there was not a lot of like pathways or kind of, you know, ways to do things. And um, it really just was like, okay, here's this model. It's like Berkeley Rep, ACT. Like we just sort of figure out how to do that on a smaller scale, like little by little, step by step, you know? Um, but I feel like I had this illusion at the beginning that it could be really different because it was small and because, you know, we were creating it and like, <laughs> you know, all these things. But like, I guess, um, you know, I, what I found out is that over time as it grew and became more complex and had more obligations and all these things that um, there were both these like external pressures that kind of, you know, just the the pressures of of money and the nonprofit model and all these kind of external things that that um, that made it really hard to to like stay like to operate in our values even though you know we were really trying to do that and then there's this other thing that was like uh, it's also just like inside of us you know it's I was like well you know just because like you know I have we all have these great intentions and we're trying to make something better and different doesn't mean that it's really going to be better and different because you know white supremacy culture is inside of me too and is inside of all of us you know so figuring out how to like how to be different like you're saying Dela, is like really complex and, and it makes me think about this like hospice and midwife curve I don't know if you guys have seen this I'm not quite sure where to reference it but it's like a, a graphic that I've seen about the just transition like the economy transition and there's like the hospice curve which is like um taking kind of old institutions that are doing things in old ways and like like dismantling them, taking them apart, helping them die. And then there's a the midwife curve, which is like creating new structures and building new things and, you know, developing new models. And, and we need them both. Like you can't, you can't, I mean, there's sort of, I, I feel like for me, at least there's this sort of um, desire to like, just do the midwifery and like, just like forget all the old stuff and just like jump straight in and just, you know, but you also need the hospice. So, and I was talking to, to somebody recently who's like, has a fairly, high up position in a large theater, but was really like turned on by all these ideas around um, solidarity economy within the arts and stuff like that. And, and I was like, great, like stay in that spot and keep doing this learning and like take it apart from the inside. You know, we need people like that who are, who are going to be actually hospicing the, the big institutions as at the same time as we need people that are building new models, like what you're talking about, Dale, and what you guys are doing. Um, Sheree and, and like a lot of different people, you know, finding these new models because you can't just like, you know, we're all within capitalism. Like we, we, we're, we, we are within it no matter how much we wish we weren't like we're, we're within it. And so we have to like find these ways to build new models um, while also, um, you know, taking apart the old ones and sort of figuring out where for each one of us, like where's our best spot in that ecosystem at any given time. And it might change. 
I got to say this from the chat. Vidhu Singh, come on with that fire, that dramaturgical fire. We need death doulas for theater organizations. Wow, that is powerful and I love it. I just interrupted someone who was about to say something. Go off. Um, I, I can, um, I, I'd like to speak something into the space. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement about um, uh, new models. Um, and I just want to point out that they're not really new models. Um, a lot of what we're talking about right now with distributive leadership um, and consensus-based decision-making and all of that, it has been part of this land since time immemorial. And if you look at indigenous practices, um, that's where this comes from. So it's not that the models are new, it's that, um, Uh, how do I say this without getting myself into trouble? Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm just saying that we really need to recognize, especially because there's a language around decolonizing. And if you are decolonizing by saying you're inventing a new leadership structure, a new leadership model, while directly pulling from indigenous leadership practices, that's... Um, yeah, all the things that Claudia is doing right there. <laughs> Speaking of emojis here. Um, and, you know, and I just also want to point out, too, that, you know, Alter Theater has is, is been around now for 17 years, and we've had a collective. We didn't have an artistic director. I took the title. I, I went to the I went to them. Um, I went to the ensemble and I said, I'd like the title of artistic director. And I thought they were going to be like, screw you, lady. We're the artistic director. What, what, what are you talking about? Um, because I knew that I wanted to start setting up the organization for transition and for me to go on to the next stage in my career. And I knew that wherever I went next, I would probably have the, art I, I, the artistic director title would be meaningful, even though it's kind of meaningless for what it is that I do, because I don't, I don't pick the shows. I love, um, Cherie, what you were talking about, about um, collective curation, because that's what we've done since day one. That's what has enabled us to, to support and choose playwrights like Diana Burbano, who's about to, to have a name who is as big as Larissa Fasthorse. So if you don't know her, get to know her. 2020 kind of stalled her career, but man, she is just, she's going. Um, and uh, uh, I, I just also want to, to, to bring us back to this idea that the, the, the models have always been around. And even if you're looking just in traditional theater um, in the Bay Area, I just wanna lift up the San Francisco Mime Troupe. When I have questions about, my God, how do you get a collective of people to, to make decisions and, and move in the same direction? I call up somebody at the Mime Troupe and I'm just like, I need coffee, <laughs> we, I, I gotta talk. Um, and you know, they're, they're, they've been incredibly generous and don't do that. Don't call people up and ask for free help. But nonetheless, I just want to lift up and point out that, uh, we have people who have been doing this work. So even though the fact that certain organizations and theaters are getting attention for doing the work because a white person has decided to do it doesn't mean that the work hasn't already been done and the models don't exist. Um, I, I feel like uh, many of us have had the experience of say, literally saying the thing out loud in the room and then a white person repeating what we said and the entire being like, yes. And then later people telling a story about the smart thing that other person said and how you should learn from them. So just yes to what you are saying. Yes to the fact that these are not, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to um, um, quote um, one of our audience members, um, Alicia, uh, executive director of the Network of Ensemble Theaters says, thank you for acknowledgement that these models and this way of thinking and framing being an ongoing continuation and honoring of indigenous knowledge and culture and tradition. Um, just yes to that. Um, uh, Cherie, I just wish that I could be a fly on the wall watching y'all do the thing you're doing. Because the thing you're doing, like I said, I, I think it's really complex and beautiful, but it's hard to do. Um, and my response to Suzanne's question, 
is because it's a really good question. I think that one of the things that I would love for young early career folks to start doing is to stop buying the grift, the lie. I'm at that age where I now remember when I was 18 and thought, well, all you have to do is break your body and work for free and say yes and be the shiniest and best person and you will be rewarded. You will become the movie star with all of the money. You will have that, that curve that uh, Brunch and Budget was saying in that earlier uh, thing where it's like you have nothing and then suddenly you have everything. Um, so I would love for our early career people to stop investing in the dying model and to stop saying yes to success that their parents or the field think are success. I would argue that doing a job that doesn't look like success today, if you invest in this new, in new ways of building, you're building the success of like five, 10 years from now. That wasn't totally articulate, but I, I hope you understood what I was saying. <laughs> and demand that you get paid a living wage. Just ask for it. You'll be surprised what may happen. I also, I, I really appreciate this. And Jeanette, I appreciate what you said. And it's just making me think about what are ways. Uh, I was in a conversation the other day about how do we move beyond land acknowledgements. Claudia, I might have been in this conversation with you. But it just, it, so it does make me think about, yes, so much of the practice that a lot of the practice I have around group and engagement is built on indigenous models. And so it's just making me think about um, that honoring and then also how to move beyond just the acknowledgement, but like, what does it mean to provide resources to, to your company or other folks in terms of like, this is a, this is a way I wanna pay it forward because I know I'm, I honor that I'm benefiting from circle practice that comes out of multiple cultures, but I know a lot of it is indigenous practice or I know a lot of the way that I think about community is based on being raised in a community with indigenous Hawaiians and what that means and the way in which that practice happens so um, I want to say that and then I think I the other thing I want to say to young professionals is follow your path like I, I'm having I don't know if anybody else on this round table feels the fishbowl feels this way or anybody who's watching but there are moments when I'm watching things right now I was like so that diversity equity inclusion stuff that some of us have been doing for 30 years like now it's hot now you want to pay for it now community is good um so I just want to honor that 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 moment also is happening and that for if I had listened to other people and Claudia, what you said, like, yeah, if I had listened to the voice that told me what I was supposed to be doing, I mean, I made a choice as a younger performer not to audition because I'm bigger bodied, I'm tall, I'm not gender conforming. I just was like, I have no desire to put myself in situations where I'm rejected. I'm already rejected in the world. So what am I drawn to? Where am I going? And so the thing I also like to tell emerging career folks or folks who are trying to shift is like, what is the thing that makes you interested? Like, what are you, what do you want to learn? What do you want to do? What do you want to make? Go find the people who are doing stuff like component parts of that or pieces of that, because that is how, that's the room I want to be in. That's the, that's the place that, I mean, because I said yes to opportunities and I did ask to be paid, those have been the most beneficial thing. Like I didn't take the route that I felt like a lot of people I knew were taking. And I see the benefit of that now. And so I just honor, I was on a journey. Somebody early on was like, just do you. Go and do the thing that is you because the you that is you is going to make the difference for other people. That's how we get out of this cycle is that we're not trying to make ourselves a thing. We're trying to actually emerge and do the bet, bring the, all of us get to be in the show. All of us get to be, everybody gets a moment in the circle, right? And so I think about that in this practice. And then the last thing I would say is, as young as you are right now, Suzanne, everybody should be mentoring somebody. Everybody should be having a, having, not that it's a ladder, but who are my elders? Who are my, who are my youngins? Because I need to be thoughtful about what am I, what am I making for them? And so what am I, and then not just for them as if they have no agency, but this other question of like decentralizing, what do they need? What do they, what are they telling me? What do I need to listen to? 
Um, I heard some advice yesterday from a younger artist and I was like, oh, they hate that. I don't want to do that. But I got to listen to you because you're telling me a truth that, I, that I'm reacting to. So maybe I need to pay attention to that reaction. So I just offer that and just appreciate. Um, yeah, I just, I'm appreciating y'all so much. <laughs> just like, because mm -hmm. yeah, my 20 plus year old self, you know, 20 years ago self, I wish I could tell them like, it's cool. You're doing the right thing. You're actually doing the right thing for what you want to become. I just want to echo so much that's been said. It's, <laughs> I just love it. So much great advice. And Suzanne, thanks for your question again, that I, it's something I think about all the time is just not wanting to like pass on these toxic, abusive, oppressive, structures and ways of being to the younger generations and not to myself either like I don't want to be a part of them you know so I just love all of the talk around wellness and asking for what you need and taking care of yourself and being unafraid to create you know to create what you feel is right um, I think that's been for for me especially during the the pandemic and the racial uprisings, like more courage and strength to say, this is not right. The structure is not right. You know, how we're spending our money isn't exactly right and we need to make it right. And how can we do that? So I think, you know, the more you can have um, the confidence to take care of yourself and to speak, which I feel like this younger generation actually, um, I've seen a lot come out of speaking their voices and posting on social media. Um, there's been, you know, medium, there's been so many prolific, I guess, I don't know if I want to call it outings, but just um, people speaking their truth and putting out there, putting it out there for us to hear. And there's been major changes. What happened in American for the Arts was a major change to get you know, someone to step out of that high leadership position and to, you know, be called to, to focus resources on equity was huge. And I don't know what's happening now at this moment, but I hope, you know, it continues to shift. Um, there's things that happened within SF Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, because staff spoke up and just said, this isn't right. Um, you know, I think finding your allies and finding your community and who is able to speak on your behalf and supporting those people. I love what uh, Center uh, CCI, Center for Cultural Innovation, these grants they have for, for people who are speaking against the grain and who are making themselves public around practices, harmful practices within organizations in the arts, you know, they're giving them a little bit of money and to do that because they get that it takes risk and it takes heartache and grief and it can be stressful. And I believe that's such a great model for philanthropy to start really funding, you know, the folks that um, are, are putting themselves on the line at times to do the work to make these changes happen. So I just wanted to lift that up. And I also just want to bring up like spirituality because I think so many times spirituality is left out of these conversations, even when, you know, we refer to our indigenous brothers and sisters and folks. Um, spirituality is huge in so many indigenous practices, giving thanks for the land, giving thanks for the elements, giving thanks for everything you have, being appreciative, you know, taking care of yourself, realizing that there are higher powers than the United States White House and president, that there are forces that can, you know, make things happen. Um, we don't bring it into our work and we don't bring it into our organizations and it's really lacking. And I think that, you know, if you can, as Allison was saying, follow your path, follow your heart, follow your inner guidance. Don't let people tell you 
that you don't know what you're doing or that you don't know what you're saying or that the money isn't there or the resources aren't there. This world is full <laughs> of resources and it's full of light and it's full of love. But we have been taught, especially I think people of color through our schools and education systems to not look for that, to not believe we don't have it, to not believe we don't have the power inside to find it and call on it. And so if you can just access that in yourself, have that confidence, find your spiritual path, you know, find what your inner heart is telling you and follow it and let it be your guide. So many things can change. So many shifts can happen. And it starts with each of us, one person at a time. So I just wanted to bring that, call that into the space. Um, yeah. And give thanks and Ashe for all the great work that everyone is doing. Um, I'm just going to just acknowledge there's an overwhelming amount of science being dropped in the chat in Crowdcast. You all are just having so many good observations. I want to make space for Seth and Emily who have joined us. Um, so welcome to the circle. We'd love to hear from you. And then um, if there's a chance, I might try and voice some of those things from the chat. But if not, I'm just doing, I'm going to encourage people to revisit the video and read the amazing conversation taking place. I love this field. Seth, Emily, welcome. Please introduce yourselves before you speak so folks know why you're, why you're awesome. Emily, would you like to start? I can. I was going to say the same, but thank you. I, um, I'm i Emily Dedakis. She, her, I'm based in Belfast, Ireland, but I'm from uh, Marietta, Georgia, and I moved away so long ago, I don't know the land acknowledgement for there, so I will need to look that up. <laughs> um, I have a question that's kind of about... Um, what can we do when we run into that toxic resistance? Because I'm I'm really fascinated by we have I've had some very surface conversations about the kind of you know leadership sharing and uh, you know that succession intentionality that I mentioned. Like say in Northern Ireland, it's a very different arts um, ecosystem, I guess. Um, and I I think when you start to have those conversations, I think conversations like this can really scare people, people that are not in this room, <laughs> I'm thinking. And I'm really curious, like how do we help people who aren't ready to remake? How do we help them trust in the collective prosperity that liberation is? You know, how do we actually like, you know, where, where, where does that enter the conversation with them? Because I think there's that kind of, um, even unconsciously, there's that clutching kind of conscious, that thing that happens when it's like, I'm scared and I'm gonna grab something and I'm not gonna see what I'm doing and I'm gonna make this process even more difficult. And, you know, so how are we speaking to power and how, what are those effective conversations like in those rooms? Um, this is Claudia. I'm just going to share the idea that it sometimes feels like you're trying to save a drowning person the drowning person is flailing because they think that you're trying to kill them and you're like no i'm just trying to save you from drowning and then they end up drowning you too i feel like that that's the story that was brought up for me with your sharing emily um welcome to the space view thank you claudia Oh, Seth, Vidu, please introduce yourselves and then please add um, add to the conversation. This is amazing. We're we're getting okay. towards. We only have about twenty minutes left, um, but we're cooking with gas, y'all. This is we've just been sharing some really powerful, good ideas. So I, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. My name is Seth Eisen, and uh, I'm coming to you from Ramatush Ohlone land, and um, I am uh, artistic director of a company in the Bay Area called iZen Presents. And we um, center uh, the voices of queer folks, um, queer ancestors. And we've been doing this work for about 15 years. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm bringing a lot today. I, I don't have any super clear thoughts, but I wanted to sort of just jump in the conversation and, and maybe bring, bring voice to the vulnerability um, that, that there is, that I'm having. I should just, yeah, it's, 
it's it's personal uh, around um, you know trying to survive. So I, I've just heard so much of what each of you shared and the different places that you've been in the process from like going, I'm letting this go, and then this is a really big relief, or I'm letting this go and I'm giving this to someone else, or I can't let it go because then the work won't continue. Um, and yeah, uh, so many pieces, so many threads. It feels really almost too big for, for this forum, but I think I just wanna speak to the vulnerability of, of being in it in this time and it's still going. And also in relationship to the conversation about, you know, this morning of, of hearing about like how the funding model is, you know, is like finally people are, are saying the real, the real words about that is just a disaster and, and it's a horrible life suck. And, um, you know, how to, how to survive uh, as an organization, as an artist, as an artist and organization that's trying to give voice to, to other artists. Um, and, you know, in this, in this moment, but also, you know, as an artist that like I've been in the, in the Bay Area for 26 years and um, centering my artist practice versus centering my own self-care and um, thinking about, you know, as we get older and continue to have um, debt, you know, student loans, um, you know, and, you know, those all-nighters where you're writing a grant or you're trying to make a program possible, um, how long can a person just continue to go on doing that, even though you believe in the work? And when does it stop? you know, being valuable both for yourself um, or, you know, for, or for others, because if you can't show up as your full self, then you're really not doing anyone a favor. Um, I've been very much interested in shared leadership. Oops, one of my vulnerabilities is, um, is, is how to take the steps towards that without writing another grant, you know, without, um, you know, asking for help. Yes, I'm asking for help, but, um, and, and it's been happening this year, uh, thanks to our new company manager of the year, um, Jesse Cohn, who's working on, on this um, um, conference, uh, we've been working together to develop one of our programs uh, with one of the artists, um, Ashe, who presented um, earlier today, uh, a program called Fab Labs, which is uh, a program about being sort of like their play shops that offer opportunities for um, QBIPOC artists to uh, explore uh, Q BIPOC histories and to offer them to the world. And um, so we've been, you know, we started slowly with one small program of expanding it and then teaming up with other organizations. And that's felt like the biggest gift. But um, just in closing, uh, I guess the question is, how do we have more opportunities, you know, to, to meet with with peers and discuss some of these things and about like, you know, when, when do you, when do you know when to fold? How do you know when to fold, you know? Um, or if it's time to like, just figure out, you know, other models to just keep going somehow. So thanks for the opportunity. I hope that made any sense. I, I want to I want to uh, call V2 in because um, um, I know we have about 15 minutes before we're closing up the conversation. So please join us, V2. And thank you for that sharing, Seth. You you inspire. I I wrote down a bunch of things, but I want to make sure we give some space for V2. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Vidu uh, in San Francisco, unceded Ohlone Ramatush Ohlone land. I'm a dramaturg. I'm a theater. I'm a sort of recovering artist, recovering academic. Uh, I honestly don't know who the fuck I am anymore, <laughs> you know, 
I'm definitely looking to find ways. I'm also looking for partners and friendships and connections. I'm looking for funding, money. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily want to make theater and art anymore. Um, so I also want to say, Seth, that I appreciate the vulnerability and I feel vulnerable too. And I hate being online like this, like publicly broadcast to the world. I think we need to have deeper conversations. And many of us are here in California. Allison, uh, you're here right now. I uh, know about your work and Ragged uh, Wing. Uh, and uh, But I think one of the things I'm noting in this time, especially with the pandemic and the uprooting and the breakdown of everything is theater as it exists is not really working so i don't want to pretend it is you know uh the world is broken um i'm far away from my family i didn't know if they could make it through covid this year with the second wave in india so to me like uh yeah so anyway so what i want to I, I do want to say like I appreciate organic pathways like the way I found Deborah last year and we started talking about the fires and uh, she let me in and working uh, with her allowed me to connect to the land and the ecology here and uh, connect to a very deep part of myself. And so I feel that I'm just following these organic things you know that's where my heart is right now you know uh, not in the place of making kind of identity-based theater or telling stories of a community i want to tell everyone's stories you know um and i also want to say seth that i love your work so much like i may not make it to all your shows but you are fucking incredible Seth, your work is so meaningful. And so there's some really cool people here and I love and appreciate you all. And Claudia, every conversation I've had with you has opened something very deep for me around power sharing. So that, that's all I need to say and let's continue the conversation. Well, y'all, this is why we do this, right? Like there's only so much we can do by ourselves. So this is uh, to a certain extent, um, uh, giving the entire field a little head start, a little jump start for conversations that are going to have to happen in real time all over the place. And I just want to affirm the idea that these conversations, these relationship buildings, they don't have to happen inside traditional or formal structures. You can just call up colleagues and have a conversation. You can just call someone. It's what I do it all the time, y'all. I'm sloppy. I just DM you on Twitter and be like, I saw your play and liked it. Can I talk to you? Can we be friends? Um, but that's actually, that's, that's, that's resistant capitalism. When you build strong relationships that are not moderated by organizational relationship, you are creating networks that are resistant to capitalism. So come on with it. Yes to that. I also just want to name something, Seth, that you brought up at the top of your sharing, which was about survival. And then I see that Anna might have something. I want to make room for it. Um, you brought up something around survival, and it brought up for me the question of what are you trying to survive, right? Like, are you trying to survive as an individual person inside of a toxic institution? Are you trying to um, have your institution survive? And is it short-term survival or long-term survival? I got to admit, I tend to think real long-term, y'all. It doesn't always serve me. I'm, I'm working on a five or 10-year plan and people are working on a, what's gonna happen this week. So sometimes I'll come in and I'll be like, that strategy will make us fail in 10 years. But they're like, it's gonna make us win this week. Why are you making us fail? And sometimes they're right. So I just wanna make room for that. I also see we've got more folks joining the conversation. I love this, we're in our last 10 minutes, making space for other folks. Go ahead and jump in, Anna. Um, I just wanna say, um, having been through this process of like, kind of divesting my leadership position, like moving, changing my position in, in the ecosystem, um, I just wanna, I just offer it to Seth privately in the ch in the chat to chat, but I want to offer that to anybody like in the community who just wants to talk. Who's like, I'm not sure like 
you know how to do this or whether to do this or what it's like um i'll put my email in the chat here and people can just send me a note but i'm ha like happy to just talk about it it it's it's a it's a whole process it's not necessarily easy i'm not done but happy to chat about it <laughs> By the way, my new resolution is to DM someone and be like, hey, can I death duel at you? Yeah, and we I just want to say we were death dueled. Ragged Moon is death dueled by um, Rebecca Novick, who's a fantastic um, uh, colleague in the field, and she was wonderful. And now I'm death dueling another organization right now, having been through that experience. So uh, it's a thing. It's really useful. Um Hey, graduate student out there, I need you to write the book. I need you to go do the labor of gathering. Maybe you don't need to be a graduate student. You could just be a person in the field, but could somebody write the death doula book that I could buy next year, please? That's amazing. From our audience, um, uh, Pamela says, redefine success and make space for collaboration. I think I saw Suzanne, go right ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving this. Um, I had a question, Claudia, about something you brought up, but I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts. Um, how do you make that network and DM people without, um, without acknowledging that like DMing and making that network is also asking them to do free labor? I can, I, you asked Claudia, but I'm going to say, then is there a conversation in the conversation about, I don't want to ask you for free labor, so can I buy you a cup of whatever, or can I share space with you in this way, or um, somebody, I could not afford to uh, to pay her to be an assistant director, and I deeply want to say, I believe we should all be paid, but she was also at a place where I was like, you're developing a new piece so can we do a swap and you're going to do this you're going to do this labor for me and I'm going to do this labor for you and we're going to do a one-to-one -one share so that neither of us is losing but we are trying to be equitable about that so maybe it's so it is I think in that conversation that's always my hesitancy of like the random people who are like oh my gosh everybody's telling me I need to talk to you and I'm like are you the 15th person I'm going to talk to you who's never going to see me again and just suck and extract all of whatever and so I just yeah what is the and I guess my other question to myself and just hearing what you were saying to do like what is the gift I need to give myself in the next moment that someone comes to ask me for help or what is the next thing I need to remind myself so that I don't because I'm a giver and I'm a caretaker I'm, I'm really trying to practice what is that what do those boundaries look like and how do I and how do I help celebrate when I've kept a boundary where I'm like, I didn't know you and I'm not giving you three hours of free time. Yay, good job. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I just, I, I would offer those little tips. Um, and I love the organicness of you don't know what you're doing right now, but you're like, yay. What, I can't wait to see what you do next because that's what we're, that's where we need you to be. So I, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you. Um, Claudia, you're muted. I muted myself. I unmuted, then I muted myself. Thank you, Dela. I interrupted you, Vito. You were about to jump in. We have about six minutes left in, in the space, so we're, we're starting to enter into that closing type of energy where perhaps the thing we say might be the last thing we say, or we might not say another thing. Um, so um, I want to make space for... Um, I, 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 your, your name has several um um uh syllables and i'm not sure where to put the em emphasis so i don't want to mispronounce your name so i'm just going to say welcome and please um share whatever you would like to share with us welcome to the space and please introduce yourself and, and share what you got to share hi my name is severin blake my pronouns are they all we calling in from the lands of the lenny lenape colonially known as philadelphia pennsylvania um yeah, there's been so much resonance in this room. Uh, and to kind of dovetail off of what Allison was saying in response to the question of like, something that's just really hot for me right now, and I popped it earlier in the chat, is that like, hmm, the flip side of urgency is spirituality and, and um, urgency sometimes and like wanting to please or be able to help and give that person a thing in order to give 
myself that grace. I have to like take a second and be like, there's that impulse and then stop and breathe and take a second with my heart and be like, and also what do my insides say? And that's something that's like super interesting because of course, like I can only speak for myself, but as a theater maker and someone who's like worked to like use their body um, and their heart and their energy in many ways to like share with other people, like to use those tools for ourselves because the body remembers, it remembers. When it betrays itself, it remembers itself in spaces, it remembers things from further back generations. Thank you for that. Um, so what I love is when you do a conversation like this well, um, towards the end of it, everybody's on fire and you keep going for another two to three hours. Of course, there are different conversations to enter, more things to explore. Um, so, oh, and I see, see, I see, I see more folks joining us. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'm playing with fire, y'all. I'm playing with fire. I see that Tierra has entered the space. Um, I'm, oh wait, no, no, no. I'm, I, I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay. I, I, I is Tierra here for the next art chair? Okay, brilliant. Because I was about to be like Tierra. I love you, and if you have something to say, I'm gonna make space for it and be dangerous. But truthfully, we should be closing out. Um, just, I just want to name such deep gratitude because none of y'all were paid money to help us have this conversation, right? We're having this conversation for free. Um, I'd like to think that this is mutual aid, that we are all getting as much as we are giving in this type of exchange. Um, but it's such a valuable exchange. And I'm just going to say it was recorded and other people are going to be able to view it and they're going to learn and the field will grow because of the thought knowledge that you shared right here in this moment. Also, kudos for the new relationships you are building. Um, I'm deeply excited about the next conversations. Um, and I, I know that I'm going to be DMing a bunch of you for, for further conversations and exchanges. Um, things that we need to stop doing, things that we have to stop doing new things that we're excited about doing, all of the things. Thank you so much for allowing us to explore all of the things. All right, so I'm closing us out. I don't know what else is involved in the closing out energy except, oh, I see I see a hand up. Go ahead, Dayla, go and ahead. And I just acknowledge your labor as the gatherer, ah. facilitator of us and the labor of folks behind the scenes. Thank you, thank you. And just gigantic kudos to the audience too, y'all. This was a this was a 135 person conversation, and um, it was a powerful one. Thank you for it. <laughs>